Hi and welcome. And I'm now joined uh, by Chris Greenhall with his new book, uh, Seducing Ingrid Bergman. Hi, Chris. How Hello, are you? Simone. Thank you. So, uh, could you tell me a little bit more about your latest book? Yeah. Um, the basic premise is it's 1945. Uh, we're in Paris. Ingrid Bergman, uh, star of uh, Casablanca, Hollywood icon, uh, walks into the uh, Paris bar in, in the Ritz Hotel. And there, waiting in the, in the bar, drowning his sorrows, is Robert Capa. Robert Capa, probably the greatest war photographer there's ever been. If you've ever seen uh, The Beginning of Saving Private Ryan by Steven Spielberg, yeah. the first 20 minutes, Steel Spielberg says, are based on Robert Capa's photographs of the D-Day landing. So Robert Capa, fantastic, brave, reckless photographer, Ingrid Bergman, Hollywood icon, romantic star, walks in. He sees her, instantly is smitten by her, and uh, with nothing to lose, uh, he writes her a little note and says, um, I, 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 I can't afford dinner and flowers, so I tossed <laughs> a coin, dinner won, I'll pick you up at 6.30. He writes this note, he bribes a bowl boy, gives him a dollar to shove it under her door in a hotel room, and uh, lo and behold, she says, okay. She didn't know anybody in Paris, she was probably hungry. Uh, and so <laughs> but why not? Someone could take me out for a meal. Absolutely, a free meal. And so she, she went out, and uh, unlikely as it is, they fell in love and they continued to see each other in, over the next few months in Paris. He then followed her to Hollywood in 1946 and was on the set of Hitchcock's film Notorious, starring Cary Grant and Ingrid Bergman. Mm. And um, so they had, you know, a, a, it wasn't a long affair, but it was a passionate, intense affair, and I think changed both their lives, really. I really love how um, someone as big as her at that time, because she was massive mm. at that time. I don't know, she's like the equivalent of, I guess, Angelina Jolie or someone like so, that. Yeah. Probably even bigger than that, because there's fewer there, stars there. fewer then. stars, yeah. I just find it amazing that a, a woman like that would actually come down to a bar and meet this guy just by a note. Well, I, I, just, sp I suppose it, well, they, they weren't particularly well-traveled. I mean, it was very yeah. difficult. You know, you still couldn't fly transatlantically, so she would have spent a long time in the boat coming over from... Uh, New York probably uh, landed in England, flown from London to Paris. So it would have been a long journey. She arrived in Paris, and you can imagine you're there, Paris, your first night. I mean, she probably hadn't been to Paris that much. She was from Stockholm. I think she'd been once before, but Paris, this wonderful city, and she probably dying to go out. And here's her, here's an excuse. She had one minder. There was a guy with her who was supposed uh, yes, to look after yes, her. Yeah. Uh, a guy called Joe Steele, who was there as a kind of... He was getting very frustrated with her, wasn't wasn't he? Because she just yeah. kept going off. And obviously she was married at the time as well, which was also a bit of an issue, really. She was married So she was on her time. own, a married woman, meets Robert, probably yeah. just thinks it's going to be dinner, but then... Well, with the daughter as well. Another, and the yeah. studio had really cultivated this image of her as a, a kind of saint. You know, she just won a an Oscar uh, for portraying Gaslight as a rather a martyr figure. She was just starring at the time in, as a nun and, um, in a film called The Bells of St. Mary. So she had this very uh, holy than now kind of figure which the studio had spent a lot of money cultivating yeah. and she cultivated, cultivated it herself. And then to be in this situation with Kappa who was a pretty much a reckless womanizer. Yeah, very um, exciting though, which is probably why she was even more attracted to that, especially on her own. In in Paris. So. Yeah, she was far from home. She yeah. was away from the constraints of the studio, which were very controlling. Her husband was pretty controlling. Yeah. So she was just suddenly liberated. Add to that the excitement that the, the war is just over. Exactly, yeah. And she's not just, you know, meeting actors anymore. She's meeting the real thing. I mean, you know, Kappa was there on the D-Day landings. Most of the central events of the Second World War, he was right there in the front line. So it must have been tremendously exciting to meet this guy, talk to him, and just hear the, the, the real stuff rather than just the movie script. And it's uh, you can see why she's in, you know captivated by him as well. I mean, everyone would obviously be captivated by her, but he was a very very interesting character himself. I mean, he was a war photographer. He'd taken some of the most memorable photographs of our time. Mm. You, you said that um, he, uh, Steven Spielberg mm. was influenced by him, and I think obviously his background made him a really intriguing person. Do you think that's probably why she was so drawn to him more than any other guy at that time? Yeah, he was a very romantic figure. He wasn't particularly tall, but he was dark and handsome. I, I, and I've seen pictures yeah, of him, actually. Yeah, I looked him up. He, yeah, he's he was, a handsome guy. Yeah. and uh, Charismatic, probably. Very charismatic. Yeah. Uh, he was Hungarian, spoke five languages, but was also deeply cultured. And I think, you know, he knew his wines. Uh, he knew his champagnes. He, he later founded the photographic agency Magnum, 
So you get the champagne reference there. He's the one that set that whole thing up, didn't he? The whole idea of photographers owning their own photographs. and Good for him. Because at the time, all the negatives, they were owned by the magazines. So he set that up. So very interesting, very cultured guy. And for all his charismatic image as a you know man about town he, he he knew writers he was a friend of Hemingway and John Steinbeck he knew Picasso and uh, Matisse yeah and so he you know he's, he, he was in culturally very culture interesting circles, and yeah. I think this would have interested Ingrid Bergman uh, because even in Hollywood the, maybe the, the the culture wasn't quite so deeply ingrained so yeah. I think she was attracted immediately to him not just to his war ex experience but to this refined sensibility which he also brought with him the kind of European sense of culture now, Chris, um, there's definitely a theme in your writing because this is obviously a romance mm. with a glamorous woman, but you've also done another story on a, another glamorous woman, Coco Chanel. Yeah. Recurring theme here, romances. Well, yeah, yeah, sure. That weren't meant to be unsung romances. Is that some? What, what is it about that type of thing that? Well, I suppose you? I was. I didn't mean to uh, repeat the theme necessarily. I mean, the first book just came out of nowhere. I saw a photograph of Coco Chanel and Igor Stravinsky. Yeah. I thought, weird. I would never have put those two together. <laughs> and I researched. I've uh, seen a picture of him. I don't yeah, see her. And, you're and like, oh, yeah, it's yeah. a bit like you know the Beauty and the Beast. Really, <laughs> it was very. That was a very strange story. Um, but an intriguing one and yeah. lots of coincidences so I was compelled to write that one then I wrote something completely different but unfortunately the publisher although they liked the writing didn't warm to the story and actually asked me to do something pretty similar with the next book so uh, so I did I mean I, 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 I resisted at first but I, I looked hard for a story that interested me and it had to be one that you know, hadn't really been told before. Um, yeah, because no one knew about this. I mean, obviously everyone knows about Ingrid Ber Bergman's affair later with Rossellini, with Rossellini yeah. which was the controversial one where she couldn't even go back to Hollywood Absolutely, after that. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is the one that was never told. So it's great that you actually managed to get that story out. Well, it, it has a few footnotes and a few small chapters in, in biographies of Kappa and Bergman, but it really, it's, it's skated over. Yeah. But I, I think it's a fascinating story. It's fascinating historically, 1945, fascinating time, the war's over, and democratically, it's a, it's a time when you get the sense that anybody could meet anybody else, and any, anything could happen, you know, the, all the rules. You the, had that feeling when you were yeah, reading it, Yeah, all the old rules yeah. were, were thrown out, and just, mm. you know, there's a new democracy in the air at the time. So that was exciting, and then uh, Bergman and Cappy, very different personalities from def very different walks of life. Uh, meeting and uh, you know the, you've got Hollywood, you've got um, the celebrity, uh, you've got the war, you've got all these ingredients, love and loss, um, romance, cr you know they were both artists, sort of creativity and so the, all the ingredients were there, for, were, were there for a fantastic story I think. No, so, it, so it wasn't just the theme, it, it, yeah. it, I was genuinely a, attracted to you know to this story. And I like the way that you write in both voices of uh, Ingrid and Robert. Did, did you find that easy to do? Like to actually get into their mindsets? Uh, did you have to study no. them a little bit? <laughs> it wasn't easy, no. <laughs> I wish it was easy. Kappa I found a little bit easier and I think as a, as a male writing about another male, even though he's quite different from me, uh, I found that easier just in terms of a male yeah, sensibility. But the, the female voice yeah. of Ingrid Bergman, that must have been that, a little bit that, more challenging. That was harder and in fact the first draft was all Kappa, it was all first person Kappa. Yeah. And then I realised once I looked at it and I had few, a few reader responses that there's probably a dimension missing. And so I went back and tried to tell the story in parallel and in some, some ways in contradiction to Kappa's story. So you get the you know, the two pulses, you get his his side of the story and then the second half of the chapter you get, you know, her re her responses, her, uh, his, he, they're both present tense, so you, they're both immediate and they're both quite urgent, uh, but his is more, I suppose, first person, hers is more third person reflective, but I tried my best to make her story authentic and convincing. No, you really did. I love the fact that you did the female perspective too. Yeah. I, I love that whole aspect. I, that was so, the hardest bit and I did try hard to get it right. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, you got it. I really enjoyed Thank that. You. And um, do you think this will be made into a movie like the other one? Well, I really hope it does. I hoping. I mean, I think it deserves to be with the whole Marilyn Monroe thing coming. I, th I really hope it does. Yeah, well, uh, I mean, some people say, did I write it for cinema? I, I didn't really write it for cinema, but I think it, 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 it's, it's, it's got cinematic potential. Well, thank and you very much, thank Chris. You very much. And that is Chris Greenhall's book, uh, Seducing Ingrid Bergman.